Ristar for the Sega Genesis is one of my favorite games of all time, but I'm not entirely sure why. I know, I know, what a way to start a retrospective, right? But in a way, it's true. I've played Ristar a lot in the past and continue to play it in the present, but when looking at a game like Ristar critically, it's kind of hard to see exactly what really sets it apart from the many other mascot platformers of its age. There were so, so, so many games that followed in Mario and Sonic's wake, frantically clawing at the public's attention to get some semblance of lasting appeal. It was a free-for-all, and as we all know, every battle has its casualties. Many games did fail to stay in the public psyche, and Ristar, unfortunately, was one of them. It just didn't get much of a chance. And that really sucks. When looking at this narration in front of me, this video might be therapy. It might just be me trying to give a game I love, one whose more cognitive appeal feels buried, a chance to be unearthed. I can recommend Ristar in a heartbeat, but I better have a damn good reason as to why. More than 25 years later, I want to hopefully understand why this odd little mascot platformer continues to be in my game rotation, long after that first hand-me-down Sega Genesis. Let's talk Ristar, and why I refuse to forget it. As I mentioned, Ristar is one of those strange little Genesis games that tended to blend into the seemingly endless pile of platformers of the age. Beyond the literal walking advertisements it was often compared to, Ristar actually had a complicated history, one intertwined with that of his speedy blue counterpart. Like Sonic himself, Ristar's origins stem from Sega's desire to compete with Nintendo's Mario, a megalithic challenge that needed a challenger to match. Among many different designs was a rabbit that could grab objects with its ears, the surreal idea that would ultimately become the Star Boy Ristar. While Sonic the Hedgehog and his rolling ability eventually got the priority as Sega's mascot, Ristar's 1995 debut on the Mega Drive was still helmed by Sega. It did manage to grab ports across other systems down the line, but it never transcended that whole underrated label. It definitely tagged along, but in the shadow of Sonic, Ristar didn't shine brightly enough for Sega. When booting up the game, it becomes clear that Ristar's home is one under tyranny, as Kaiser Greedy, the main antagonist, enslaves the leaders of the various planets across the galaxy and defeats the legendary hero, Ristar's father. Ristar's summoning pulls him into action, setting the stage for a battle that cascades across multiple planets. The narrative of different areas being steadily infected and controlled by a villainous entity, ultimately leading to a mechanized dystopia at the endgame, seems almost suspiciously on the nose for Sega. Sure, many games have played that card before, but Ristar's story feels like a lesser example of the idea. The concept of the leaders of each planet being tainted by Greedy's influence is a pretty grim angle, one that's all the more potent when boss fights often have Ristar battling the inhabitants themselves. Ristar's story doesn't go too far into unknown territory, and while its stakes are high, Greedy's actual presence doesn't really solidify. It's not until the final boss fight when his power becomes intimidating in a more overt way. The lush and bountiful planet Flora acts as Ristar's opening level, introducing the player to the hero and his unique gist. The key element of Ristar's origins, the ability to reach and grab items from a distance, did stick around in the final product. Instead of the ears of a rabbit, it became extendable arms, which can grab, hold, and pull objects and structures in the environment. It sounds goofy, and under early pretense it is, but what makes it all so incredibly fascinating is just how much is done with it. You can grab and attack enemies, you can circle around trees, you can grab floating objects, then swing back and forth to gain momentum before leaping upward. It's a basic but fully realized multi-purpose mechanic brought to life by level design that encourages learning its potential. It very much shares the ideology of a Sonic the Hedgehog game, which limits its protagonist's moves to simple, easy-to-execute abilities that only grow and exhume versatility as the game progresses. This is all complemented by the fact that Ristar can aim his grab. Whether a target is in front of him, in the air, or even directly below him, Ristar's main ability capitalizes on precision in all eight directions. 
Mid-air antics are really where things get most impressive, as the ability to grab enemies or objects while flying around the stage is stylishly animated and a dream to pull off. It's a signature move that rewards skill, but still feels incredibly unique. And yes, Ristar's basic movement might seem sluggish at first, but that's a necessity to make his grab easy to manage and control. As a result, Ristar demands focus more often than reflexes, and that more patient pacing might turn off some who've associated themselves with faster and more intense titles on the Genesis. But when the flow hits, Ristar really pulls it off. With techniques so approachable, Ristar freely lets the level and challenge design broaden the utility of the moveset. Environmental elements populate each stage with such density, begging for the player to try out Ristar's techniques and see how they can be used to their advantage. It's really awesome finding something new in a level than figuring out how the grab and hold mechanic activates it. Attacking the light trees in Planet Flora's dark woods illuminates the stage when the canopy grows dim, letting Ristar avoid incoming attacks more easily. The pulley systems in Planet Scorch's under factory let Ristar raise and lower himself to avoid fire projectiles. It's a very explorative game, richly cultivated with opportunities to curiously unearth new traversal options or simply to find some strange level gimmick that's worth learning about further. But unlike those gimmicks, there are the notable star handles. In an unusually frenetic gesture, these handles let Ristar swing around and build momentum, before rocketing off in a destructive shooting star attack when fully charged. It's probably the rare instance in the game where the high-speed spectacle is a focus, and you can get some pretty wild distance and height if you know what you're doing. As cool as these are to use, I honestly don't think the game needed them, as they clash pretty hard with the more leisurely movement of its main character. But this is Sega in the 90s, they always needed some kind of chance to flex on the competition when it came to graphical spectacle. Nothing was safe, not even a game paced like Ristar. The stages don't stay in a single lane though. More often than not, Ristar's key techniques are thrown for a loop by adding some extraneous factor. Planet Undertow is a full-on water planet, which is surprising since Ristar's movement is far more fluid and quick beneath the waves, and this is only the second planet of the game. The fourth planet, Planet Sonata, introduces a music theme, with its first stage being a collective of fetch quests, where a local is asking for a metronome item to be delivered before letting the player pass. Planet Automaton's brain maze is a string of puzzle rooms which must be completed in different ways to progress. The bouncing drums of Dance Dance, the slippery ice of Splash Snow, Ristar's aesthetic flair hides some pretty diverse level design, where the gimmicks steadily flow in but don't go too far off the established path where Ristar's movement can't flourish. There's just so much going on here. Ristar's boss fights manage to stay compelling on their own, with their varied attack patterns and unique backdrops. Each one feels climactic in the right ways, often using Ristar's abilities creatively. Planet Scorch's Adahan Fall boss lets you grab onto its rocket claws to deal damage if your timing is on point, while Planet Freon's Itamor Lunch has you avoid attacks while feeding the boss super hot food. These are, once again, subtle gimmicks that keep the encounters feeling fresh, and the boss fights feel cinematic in their backdrops, like the literal stage of Planet Sonata's boss fight. There aren't many moments where you're waiting around for a vulnerability phase, there's almost always something going on that you need to contend with. However, later bosses tend to show a spotlight on the easy-to-abuse invincibility frames, as simply wailing on an enemy non-stop till they fall can get you far against Automaton's Uranim power fight or the penultimate battle against Ionis. It's an awkward stretch as the player approaches the final act of the game. And despite its epic aesthetics, the final boss fight against Kaiser Greedy leaves something to be desired as well. The challenge is there for sure, but it's a surprisingly brief confrontation that lacks the phase variety of other boss fights. While bosses like Adah and Fall give you a ton of ways to dodge attacks or deal damage, Greedy's fight feels too straightforward, neutering what should be an absolutely epic closing act. Even the post-fight cinematics and credit sequences don't feel quite as celebratory as other games in its style. In what should feel like a job well done, Ristar's final moments close on a bit of a whimper. Credit is certainly due to the game's animators, who've given Ristar a brilliant amount of expression and personality. There are so many subtle touches to give the character energy and enthusiasm, his idle animations vary depending on the stage, and even the brief sparkle that appears when he lands on the ground shows that the animation team wanted to make a hero that could stand out from the crowd. Enemy variety can feel a tad lacking, especially the repeated base minions which manage to be used as far as the final boss fight, but there are still plenty of thematically appropriate designs for the enemies spread across the planets. Lots of foes have that stage-specific theming, which translates into the environment design as well. 
Each planet has a striking brilliance and variety in their backgrounds and foregrounds, while subtle touches like the enemy tossing attacks from the background of dark woods give an enormous sense of breath to the world. I really do love the art direction in this game. Riftstar has a kind of rich clarity that I haven't seen in a Sonic game, or any other Mega Drive game for that matter. Even in a Genesis title in the tail end of the console's lifespan, Ristar's graphics are a high mark, a culmination of everything the system was capable of on a visually aesthetic level. It's so easy to love. Ristar's soundtrack is about as Sega as it gets, with beat-driven themes and catchy melodies galore. It often lacks the grimy metal aesthetic of other titles on the system, but it's clear that the developers were aiming for something less hard-hitting here. Brief vocal samples and plenty of funky percussion powering the OST make it feel just right for a game like this. Tomoko Sasaki's compositions don't stray too far from something like Sonic the Hedgehog, so I can say with certainty that if you dug the music in that series, you'll find something to love in Ristar's music too. In fact, the sound design in general feels equally attuned to Sega's style at the time. Attacking enemy slams with a resonating impact, the little gleaming sound effect when Ristar jumps is pristine and shimmering. It's a style fitting for the final hours of the Genesis life cycle, one that celebrates Sega's increasingly unique tone and touts a summation of its defining bits. Throughout this retrospective, I've been comparing Ristar to Sonic the Hedgehog a lot. Normally I would shy away from rampantly referring to another series throughout a video, but I'm making these comparisons for two reasons. The first is that Ristar's history is directly connected to Sonic's. These two characters share origin stories and design motives. Ristar was just the one that got the short end of the stick in the end. The second reason is that, by comparing Ristar to Sonic, I'm hoping to provide perspective on why these characters' differences matter. Even when matched against the more prolific and longer-lasting series that Sega champions even to this day, Ristar and its distinctive elements are still there. They carry the character's identity and the uniquely crafted game that surrounds it. Ristar's less propulsive gameplay hides a deep exploratory focus on his inherent ability. Grabbing and interacting with different things in each stage show how complex level design can flesh out a mechanic as definitive as Ristar's. It may not have the immediate spectacle of other games of its era, but this game does a lot more than many might assume. During my youth, a time when I was still attempting to understand the Sega Genesis beyond Sonic the Hedgehog, Ristar managed to deliver a world rich with style, while its titular hero's unorthodox collection of techniques made exploring each stage a fun, challenging experience. Despite what history might implicate, Ristar and Sonic can coexist. Before wrapping up, there lies the lingering question of whether Ristar could exist as a franchise. It certainly would be interesting to see a remake with high bit sprites refining the art style with HD quality tech powering it. And there's even the idea of translating Ristar's mechanics into 3D, something that would take some real thought to make work, especially when it comes to the precision of the grab and hold technique. Grappling hooks have been a hot idea in games for a while now, so in theory, Ristar could adopt that design direction if 3D did in fact become a worthwhile pursuit. Do I envision, or even consider, a potential future for Ristar? I'll be honest with you, I don't. I like the game a lot, don't get me wrong, but there's something very special about a single one-shot console experience managing to influence your taste 25 plus years after its debut. I've made a case about iterating game ideas and giving them another chance, but with Ristar, its place is set for me. This is one of those extremely rare, solitary Mega Drive experiences, one that fits nicely on its own into the grander tapestry of video games. It surely has room for evolution, but in doing so, its identity could potentially be distorted. I like to imagine Ristar as a stalwart pillar, a piece of gaming history that I do hope more people give a chance in its original 16-bit form. In a nutshell, it doesn't need any more to be what it is. A damn fun platformer that more folks should remember. So yeah, Ristar is one of my favorite games of all time. And I do hope after this video, it becomes your next favorite too.